I'm Ryan Durbin from RD Ceramics, and I'm located in Southgate, Kentucky. And I'm Becca Otis from Five Lines Pottery in Monroe, Washington. And welcome to Wheel Talk. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Wheel Talk. This one's going to be a little bit different than normal. Becca's not on this episode, but I was able to get a feature artist while I was at a workshop this past weekend in Columbus, Ohio. So before the workshop, I talked with this guy on social media and asked him, hey, we're doing this workshop. I'm going to attend. Can I get some time with you afterwards to record a podcast? He graciously agreed. So let's get to our talk with John Schmidt Pottery, also known as John the Potter on YouTube. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy. All right. So yeah, might as well just start. Yeah, yeah, people like to go. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're live. So uh, welcome to Wheel Talk. We are having a little different today. Um, this episode is just me. Becca's not here, but I have another guest here today. So we've got John Schmidt. From... What's up, guys? <laughs> How's so, it going? So everybody probably knows uh, if you follow YouTube or have any like instructional videos that you watch on YouTube, like you've probably seen John's videos. His enthusiasm and his like personality comes out in every video, so you probably know him from there. Um, but yeah, we just had a workshop. How did you feel the yeah. workshop? So yeah, we just did our first ever workshops. Uh, we're in Ohio, and Ryan got in like a few days uh, earlier, so yeah. there was a wait list to get in. I was lucky that we sold out pretty quick. It was super fun. The thing sold out in like hours. Yeah, yeah, which was... It was cool, but I was I was really nervous actually to like do the workshop. It's just like I've never done a workshop before. Yeah. Um, it's just I can't edit out like you yeah, know yeah. like I'm so used to like if I record a video and I don't really like what I did or I don't like how I looked or whatever I can just redo it and I don't like what I said I'll just yeah. edit it out whatever. But uh, that is not how it works in live. Are you like relu- were you reluctant because you were you were like I know I have a following online, but how does that translate to a specific area? on a specific day at a specific time and there's 20 slots right like, right is that where it's tougher to yeah i just i felt or like was it the content yeah i is it was a couple things i think i think you know catering to the audience online is like i can put up a video and if you like the topic then you can watch it if you don't you don't have to watch it but when i have 30 people here um i have no idea if they're total beginners if they've thrown five pots or if they've like you thrown for 10 years and like i learned stuff from you and so it's like how do i cater this workshop to both the beginner and the advanced right um while making it interesting and entertaining and you know people came here to see me and they've seen me on videos and how do i live up to that expectation because yeah. people probably they evidently like me online so right <laughs> um and a lot of the con and the content on youtube is free so right. they're not paying for it they don't have to really commit too much right right to yeah. like watch a video so yeah so yeah, I was and I was just nervous because I'd never done a workshop before. You know, I've done a little public speaking here yeah. and there, but um, when all the eyes are on you, it's yep, like yep, okay, yep. you're the one driving the content that's going to happen yeah. for like four hours yep. or however long, and it's like. And I also feel like you know my whole kind of mentality around pottery and ceramics is like keep things simple, do things that you can do quickly and efficiently. Um, and when you look at people's work online and they have all this intricate design and like all this stuff, it's like. It's interesting for people to want to learn from me, where I don't feel like what I'm doing is that difficult. I feel like I have a pretty straightforward approach. Um, and so to bring it here and try and think about things that, I, you know, how do I fill up three and a half hours when I'm trying to make mugs in a minute, you know, or a minute and a half. Exactly. And so, um, but I, I felt like it's good. I, I, uh, I think it went well. And, like, a lot of people can do similar things. So you're like, how do I differentiate what I can yep. talk about right. so it's not, like, steps that right. anyone else Right, right. Or a bunch of other people do and yep. can do. Anyway, yeah. So. And so I tried to I tried to have different kind of stages where I did some throwing demos and then I did some where people could work on their own mug and make kind of like a custom mug like I usually would make. Uh, and then some glazes because I've been using the Mako glazes and we were lucky enough, we're at Mako right now at the factory where they make all the glazes. And so it was cool to be able to have them here too to support that. And then the business side because I really feel like that's where I can bring a, a lot of value is the, the way that I've been able to create a business around pottery and yeah. be able to sell it without, you know, like... I just have such a strong mentality towards, like, building a following and c- providing value for people will equate to sales in the future. Right. And that's what I don't think everybody thinks about when they get yeah, to the pottery. That's actually a question that I thought was unique to you that I could, like, ask was, so I'm under the same impression that if you provide more value to people than you take, like, give more than you take, yep. like, then it's going to benefit you long term and it's not going to be as, like, I guess, demanding on you to 
kind of schlep pots around and figure right. out how to sell them. You, right. If right. you're giving people value, then it's easier for them to make that purchase because they've already got so much money from you already right. and value. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and it's all, I mean, for me, it's like, I don't want to have to be, you know, going around to breweries and coffee shops and saying like, I can make you mugs for 12 bucks and then you can sell them for $24. And then I'm stuck making a thousand mugs a month and making less than if I can sell mugs for 40 or 50 or 60. Um, and so, yeah, you just got to provide people with a lot of value and then they're just like, Oh, we want to, we want to buy your stuff. And it's like, you know, it's, it's really cool. And so it's fun to be at that point now, two, three, four years later where, uh, I, I actually just spent, you know, a year just sharing almost everything that I have. And now I'm at the point where I'm learning new things so that I can share more with other people. And that's been really fun too. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing your YouTube, you didn't ever expect it to be this big. No, in no, like no. Two years. So no, I wanted a thousand subscribers in one year is what I, okay. what I said. When, when did you start? February, 2018. Okay. So a year later we were at like 30,000 or something That's and crazy. yeah now we're at like 75 i feel like because i've kind of mapped some things on like instagram it's easier because i can like look at a number and just like do you do you jot notes as you were going like this month i was at this number and then you kind of like look at it over time yeah just because you're not going to know right or does youtube have those statistics so you can look at like well the nice thing about you know youtube and instagram and all that stuff is you you're basically documenting your life a little bit. So, you know, there's that video last year at the Art Wander where I celebrated, like, we went over 5,000 subscribers on September 28th Mm -hmm. of 2018. So I can look back at that video and say, like, that's when we went over 5,000. And then, you know, we hit 20,000 and we did a giveaway or whatever. And so I kind of have those, like, backlog videos as the documenting. So it's like, wow, we've come a long way. Because you, like, use you got to celebrate those wins. Like you talked about today, you got to celebrate the milestones that's relative to you and not... Yeah, yeah. Not comparing to other people and like, oh, I got to get to that number because that person's at that number and they're right. successful. Right. Comparison is the thief of joy. Like, if you're comparing yourself to everybody else, you just have no fun. Like, everybody is, someone's going to be bigger than you all the time. Like, I'd love to have 4 million subscribers like Peter McKinnon. But, like, I'm not going to kill myself to get to 4 million. Like, I'm super happy with where I'm at right now. I was super happy with where I was at a year ago. And so, yeah. if you can be happy with where you're at, then it just makes the process, the journey, like, that much better yeah and you've got to like what you're doing along the way or else yeah. it's not like you're not your enthusiasm is not going to come through if you're not excited about what you're doing yeah. if you didn't like videography like right. the quality wouldn't be there as as good exactly and, yep. yep that kind of stuff so um we're videoing this too so yeah. i got my camera on us yeah so you can come check out the john the potter youtube video of Brian Durbin and john talking <laughs> yeah we'll see how it goes um <laughs> i have a lot of footage after this weekend yeah Ooh. almost lost you all right, so um, we, I kind of asked a question about this earlier. So you're at a stage where you have a certain amount of following. You know, you have more flexibility. You said the following kind of came first where you kind of wanted to get to this amount of people that mm-hmm. could potentially buy your stuff, kind of mm-hmm. like the funnel you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You get a big enough group of people, then you need, you know, you don't need as many people to buy your stuff right. to keep up with the de- demand. Right. You know, you do you feel like you've kept, you're at a good spot where you can keep up with the demand or there's too much demand and you're... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because you can use a, di- a couple different levels. Um, you know, for me, it was, it was nice because I always had the safety net of the coffee shops and the pottery sales there like you know i can always make a mug and sell mugs there for 20 to 30 bucks like that will always be there if i want it or need it right um the advantage of having a bigger following is that you can just experiment with new techniques like this colored clay thing is pretty expensive to do because it's pretty labor intensive wedging the color in the clay and stains are expensive but i have this bigger group of people that are possibly willing to buy at a higher price and so you can use I mean, the supply and demand is basically, like, if you have a higher demand and your supply is still the same, then the price is going to go up. Like, it's just business right. economics 101. Um, because if, if all of a sudden Etsy sells out in five minutes, well, then, like, price can go up. And so it's mm-hmm. weird. It's, pricing is a weird thing. It's probably one of the hardest things as an artist is to price your work because you're putting a value on something that other people do it. Um, and so are you going to price it higher because you have more people following you? and Or are you going to... It's just it's just a tough thing. There's so many components to it. And so um, I think for me, what is, so what is the question? I wanna, if you've got your – do you feel like you're at a point where you have maybe more flexibility to make what you want? Yes. Because you know that it's going to sell? Yes. Ultimately, do you still have like, like – 
uh, reluctancy when you put stuff up on Etsy still? Yes. Every time I put so up know? stuff up on Etsy, I don't know if it's going to, like, I think it'll probably sell. I think there's going to be eyes on it. Um, but, yeah, I, I get nervous before I put it up. It's like, maybe nothing will sell, and then I'll be, like, just discouraged and like oh man whatever that's not good but it also is comforting because it's like now i feel like i have so many different ways that i can take it like between like the cozy cups was a really cool thing the Mocha monkey mugs have always sold when i put them up on etsy like the minnesota mugs sell even to people that are outside of minnesota and so i feel comfortable with you know the things that we've done i can always go back to old things which encourages me to try new things right like i always have those bank of things it's like i've done that i know it sells well but I want to keep going. I want to keep mm-hmm. experimenting. I want to get to that next thing. And so it does. That fo- yeah, I think it, you're right in saying that the bigger the following, the bigger the people that are following you, like the more comforting it feels to be able to experiment and try new things. Right. I think that's kind of the state where I'm at because I'm I'm doing this as a side hustle, so yeah. I'm kind of using the time lot, like time as my like strong suit that I don't have to like rush. Right. And I don't have to like struggle to like pay a bill at the end of the month. Right. Right. So I'm trying to figure out like you know, what changes or what decisions can I make to, you know, have the most bang for my buck when I'm selling at a show, yep. like picking the right shows that are good yep. or, yep. you know, choosing the right things to and put online because I hate the photography yeah. part of it. Do you, yeah. do you, you do the videography, but do you like the photography? Yeah. Part? I mean, when you pull 50 mugs out of a kiln and you're like, God, okay, I got to take pictures of all this. That is not my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. That is, um, I mean, I think if I got to a point where I could have someone else doing that for me, and it's not the hard stuff, you know, you take a mug, you put a camera in front of it, you get the settings right, and then you take seven pictures, you mm-hmm. know, seven different angles. Like, right. So it's not tough. It's something that somebody else can do. I think I'd, I'd get to the point where I'd have someone else do that. Um, yeah. Because online is, you know, that's definitely where the most people are. That's definitely where the most people that have money that is are willing to spend on right. art are. You know, in Waconia, Minnesota, there's 13,000 people there, and most of them aren't going to buy a 50 or 60 or $70 mug. But on, on online, they might. Yeah. Um, so yeah. do you feel like you've priced yourself out of, like, shows or even, like, Mocha Monkey? Do you price it differently at Mocha Monkey because it's kind of your staple So place? what I've – yeah. What I've kind of done now is I've taken the more unique things, and I, I think this is what I'll do in the future is I'll take some of the best things that I like, and those go up on Etsy for a higher price. And then the things that don't come out are that are not – I shouldn't say don't come out as good, but are not as unique or not as, um, like, the, the marble clay and the intricate, like, stuff that I do with the marbling where we put states. Like, just the best stuff I'm going to put up on Etsy yeah. for a higher price. And then Your more production stuff Yes, yeah. is the Mocha Monkey, yep. like, lower price. Yep, yep, yeah. 30, I mean, it's still, you know, going to be between 30 and $50 for mugs, and, mm-hmm. and I, I don't want to get too far where I'm selling stuff way more online and way less than Mocha Monkey because there is kind of some, like... I don't know, ethical, moral stuff there. It's yeah. like you want to be consistent. And um, you want your area to afford pottery. Right, right. If it prices them out, then it's like, mm, right. then you can only sell online and you don't really. Right. And then again, it comes back to supply and demand. I mean, the demand in Waconia, Minnesota is not that high for high-priced pottery, but mm-hmm. online it is. And so does that warrant a higher price? And then yeah. you think about all the time that goes into photographing, listing things online, posting, like marketing the Etsy restock or whatever kind of restock, and then watching the re- and then come in, organizing the orders, getting them all shipped out. Like that time has to come from somewhere. So I feel like that warrants a little high price too, mm-hmm. higher price. Yeah. So what's your, like, next thing that you're kind of thinking about? Are you trying to figure out how you can offload certain parts of the process, or are you... Yeah, I think, you know, I'm pretty happy with how much I'm able to make at this point. I don't think I want to have, you know, three people working in my studio every day, I'm cranking out 200 mugs a month or a week or whatever. Um, I liked the workshop. I was I was excited for this weekend to see, like, how the workshop went. So you're kind went. of figuring out business model-wise, yeah. is, this, right. is this worth it, you know, building up you know, you've already done the content. Yeah. You know, you right. can scale this and yep. use that same content and go to like, you yep. know, five or six different cities or whatever and yep. do the same thing. And yep. it's a weekend. Of, right. You know. I, yeah. I think the production side of things is fun. Um, like I like the stu- the times in the week where I get to just crank out a bunch of mugs and you get, you're like, I love watching your stories cause you're cranking out pots like crazy. Um, but I, I don't think that's where I want to go is, like, have restocks every week and have 30 so pots. So you don't feel like a machine. In right, your, right. Like... I, like the, I like experimenting. I like connecting with people. Um, I like having time in the studio. I do. I like it all. And 
so having that balance, I think for me, the next year mm -hmm. in 2020 is to kind of figure out like maybe we do a little pottery road trip where we see some studios and we do some workshops. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I, the, the you, fun, exciting parts is what I like like going after. Yeah, you know? and you and your wife just had a second child, so yep, I'm sure you're yep, adjusting and yep. figuring out the balance. Yeah, so my, my wife's a kin, uh, art teacher, so she's a kindergarten through fifth grade art teacher, but she gets she's going to take the rest of the year off, and she'll still have her position next fall. Um, so she's kind of working on the stay-at-home mom type thing, and I could have her help me in the studio, so there's a lot of different ways that we can go in the future, but yeah. we're just uh, enjoying our little boys right now. Nice. Yeah. Um, so I guess a little separate, I was curious about, so some of the like... I guess the money side that's like behind the scenes of what people might not know, like yeah, yeah. YouTube, like how do you get paid or like yeah, yeah. how, how much are you actually making on it? Is it worth, yeah, I'm sure it scales based on how many you have following you and stuff like that. Yeah. So you just want to know specifics about how the paid YouTube channel works? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'd say, so basically payment on YouTube has nothing to do with how many subscribers you have. Uh, it has nothing to do with, well, how many subscribers you have. It has everything to do with how many views you're getting and how the ads are placed by YouTube in your um, videos, which is a pretty arbitrary thing because you really have no control over what ads people are seeing, who's clicking on them. Like, they have some algorithm behind the scenes yes. determining interests of the people that are watching and what else they're watching. Right. And like, you watch my YouTube video, and you might get an ad that's totally different from, you know, the lady down the street that's watching the YouTube video, and her interests are different than yours. Right. So it has a lot of variation. Pretty much you have no idea. You just see what comes in. Mm -hmm. Basically, over the past two years, you know, it started at 20 bucks a month I was making on videos, and then it was 40 and then it was 80 and Did then you was... always produce the same number of videos the whole time? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I was trying to go two videos a week, every week, for a long time. Right. Now I'm right down, I'm now on a one video a week, just a lot based on how much quality I expect out of myself a little bit now, and right. it just takes a little bit more time to plan and edit videos, and so I've gone down to one a week, and because I'm, like, doing stuff like doing workshops and trying new stuff and putting stuff online for sale and... So anyway, two videos a week was what I wanted to do to really, like, gain the following. Um, so started at a low number, and then we got up to maybe 200 bucks a month, and that was... You can go into each video Is and see kind exactly of how much... sustaining the the effort and time that you want to pay, be pay yourself like hourly for that videography work or do you just see it as fun money well for a while it was fun money but your... yeah and for a while it was just like oh this is cool like they're paying me 200 bucks a month um and now it's a little bit more like oh i could really build a business around this being one of the revenue streams you know mm -hmm. like the youtube ad money is pretty good and then other stuff so to answer the question to get back to it it's gone up to as much as like 1200 dollars a month and but then it goes down because we'll hit a viral video that'll like do right. really well and that video will make like eight hundred dollars just that video. But then once that video is like not really like getting that many once views it anymore, its peak, it's right? Then it comes down. back down. So I'd say anywhere from like three hundred to a thousand bucks a month is anywhere from mm -hmm. what the AdSense makes. Yeah, and if you and that adds up all the videos views together yes yep. that you have in your so arsenal. each video that i've ever produced you know 200 videos if that gets watched right now it might make like 10 cents today and so the the mm -hmm. more videos you have on the channel then the more it's like a compounding right. thing That's right? why you keep, yeah yep. just like you were saying the snowball of your following yeah yeah build it up over time and it's going to add together and right people are going to find you from their mother that follows you that just started taking a pottery class right. and they're like go check this guy out yeah yeah and how many thousands of people around the yep. country and the world are telling each other right that well and then every time like this is kind of what i think happened at the beginning of the school year was i took like a two or three week break where i didn't post any videos and typically like if i'm not posting videos then the money that i'm making is going down because new people aren't finding me i'm not getting new views whatever um but it was just kept going up at the beginning of the school year and i was i it took me a while to realize like i think that people are taking pottery classes in school high school or college and then they're going home and they're looking up youtube videos and they're finding me oh. and so it was like the beginning of the school year was growing even though i wasn't posting any videos it was like this should be going down what's going on um and then it levels off because like it's the middle of the semester yeah. and so i'm interested to see like that's maybe, cool to, yeah yeah and you could like tailor like okay i gotta have this arsenal of new videos that are gonna come on like, right fresh when a right. bunch of new people are finding me yeah like so i'm already thinking in youtube titles like so you just took your first pottery class or something like that would be a great title with yeah. you know whatever yeah. so 
And yeah, that's something yeah. that you learn experience-wise over time that you're like, I want to fine-tune and yep. the quality and... Yep. Now as I'm shooting videos, I'm like thinking of the titles because the title is so, so important and like what's going to be the thumbnail, you know? Like the picture that we took or one of the screenshots where I was like holding me in the foreground and then everyone else in the background, mm -hmm. like I'm thinking that that will be a Ooh. thumbnail for the video about this workshop. Yeah. So like I'm already just thinking about the things that are important, which are titles and thumbnails in the yeah. YouTube world. And like all those little experiments... Do you see them all as just a bunch of mini yep, experiments yep, yeah. to figure out what works? Right, and right. Tailor, yeah, like I just, it. the other week I posted a video that was like only a minute and a half long. It was just basically a, a couple clips of me throwing colored clay. And I was like, oh, we'll see how this video does because it was pretty easy to make. It wasn't too hard. And it, and it did pretty well. And it's like, you know, just experimenting and to see what helps. Mm -hmm. the tutorials always do well, but they're yeah. not as fun to make sometimes. <laughs> nice. Um, and then the last, I guess the last part, where are we at? 19 something? Um, are you so like on YouTube? Are you making the videos more for? You're kind of figuring out the the topics to do next. Mm -hmm. You got 200. Like, are you making them more for yourself now? Or are you thinking of like audiences and like what techniques you haven't tried that maybe they're interested in, or like business things that you could yep. speak to? Yeah. Yeah, I think for me it's a good variety, and then it's it's also just like if I make things that I'm excited about, then the videos come easy. Like if I'm excited about the content and if I'm excited about the videography behind it, then the editing is fun. But if I'm like not really excited about the idea and I'm just doing it because I think people will click on it or whatever, mm -hmm. then it just doesn't, it's not as fun. It doesn't get done. Like I'll just push it off and be like, I'll edit that later. And then I never do, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it seems like if I just make the stuff that I'm excited about, then that gets other people excited too. Yeah. I think that's one of the best things about my YouTube videos. I just like, I don't contain my excitement, and I just, yeah. like, let it out, and then people are like, oh, that is a cool thing, even if yeah. it's, like, totally terrible. It's like, John thinks it's cool. Maybe it yeah. is cool. Is there a video, for example, that, like, you didn't do as well with it? That's not just, like, an old video. Right. That you could say, like, oh, you know, I didn't really put as much effort into this one, but I put it out, but maybe, like, you know, I could have done better with it. Yeah. Or, or it oh, just definitely. Didn't, it just flopped because you didn't put enough effort, and it's, like, an example. Yeah, I mean, I did a video about, like, the cone, not that long ago, it was, like, a couple weeks ago, about the cones, like, a, an explanation of the cones, mm -hmm. just because someone tagged me in a post and they were about to fire a bis kiln, and it was set to cone 6, and so I commented on it, I was like, hey, wait, you think you mean cone 06, and... They were like, oh, thank you so much. Like, they were about to do a bis kiln to cone six, which would have totally, like, it wouldn't have ruined anything, but they just, the glazing would have been tough, right? Right. Um, so I was like, I need to do a video just explaining cones. And I didn't really, like, I didn't talk about how cones melt in the thing, and I didn't show, like, a melted cone. There were just, like, some things I could have done that would have been way better. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, most of the, all the videos that I'm doing right now are getting, like, ten to 15,000 views, and that one got, like, 6,000 views. So I was like... You're talking about total, like, as of now? Yeah, 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 yeah. As of now, yeah. Most the, all the videos I'm putting up recently are mm -hmm. are up, you know like I did a video about the art wander, this art show, and nobody really cares about that. But besides it's the people that specific. are in the local area, yeah. and so that just doesn't do that well. Um, yeah. But yeah, that making a mug, six hundred and forty thousand views. That's a that's a game that when you get those videos, they're game changers for the channel. Like yeah, I bet fifteen thousand subscribers of mine came from that video alone. That's crazy. And yeah, that's crazy numbers. It is, and it's like. When that video was going viral, like, you could just see there, it was coming in at, like, 1,200 subscribers a day, like, just because of that video. And it's, like, you know, That's so nuts. it's it's nuts. So what, what's the thumbnail for that? Oh, the, it, the oh, thumbnail, the... the one where I'm, like, throwing the pots up and they're, like, suspended in the air. Yeah. And it's, like, turn this into this. Um, oh, okay. And so... Yeah. The thumbnail was good, the title was good, and then the content was unique, you know? It was, it yeah. was like, people got to see... And then you got to think of, like, length of time that it is and yep. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the time makes a big difference. You know, YouTube really likes videos that are over 10 minutes. Um, but that one was only 9 minutes, so... Yeah, it's just, you could just go all so day. So people that are, like, that are, like, struggling to, like, get a following or something, like, what's an easy, like, blanket thing that, like, anybody can do that you would say, rather than saying, like... Go figure out videography. And right, right, right. I mean, I'd say a great first step is to set up your phone and video yourself and post some videos. Like, if you're if you're throwing... Um, that's specific to YouTube only. What if it's, like... I'd say Instagram, Instagram too. Or, I'd say yeah. Facebook. Like, I'd, any of them. Um, even, like, you know, LinkedIn. Like, I know LinkedIn is a big social media platform that I don't do at all that people mm -hmm. are, like, gr raving about right now. Like, it's, like, one of the biggest. Mm -hmm. Um and I use Pinterest a lot for Pinterest. Photos. Yeah, like I just, I was on just like a Pinterest kick back like 
probably five or six months ago when mm-hmm. I just got on it, and I just went through like all of my Instagram photos that were already on my phone yep. in the Instagram folder, and like just posted like yep. crazy, just dumped like twenty things. Yep. Like one day, and then like on a Friday afternoon after work, I just posted like forty things. Yep. And, yeah. And then the numbers just go up because more people. That's just another audience group that people can see your stuff. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And I I, I think just taking pictures and videos and posting them in places and then see where you get results and see are people watching it here are people watching it here are people commenting here like what kind of videos do they like and it's like time i said that in the workshop today is like time is your biggest asset like you just need to put some time in don't expect it to happen overnight because it's not going to happen overnight um you know someone asked me that recently they're like does it seem like you like became youtube famous like overnight i was like no not at all like it took three years from the idea to where I am now Mm -hmm. and it took a ton of like me researching how to be a videographer and you know this is my second camera and my sixth lens that I bought and like I've sold my other camera now and sold and it's like so it takes time you you don't get there overnight so it's like I mean it sounds like it's overnight because you're like two years ago I started like February of 2018 I started and now it's you know what November of 2019 and you're like right oh that doesn't seem that long and 70 75,000 plus later yeah but it but it's constant you know I was constantly thinking about the YouTube channel for many months and you're putting a lot of work in there if Mm -hmm. people are just posting something and then like dipping out Mm -hmm. you probably do you and are you with the engagement part of it like can you you probably can't keep up with engagement yeah like for a while i would sit up late at night and respond to every comment on the youtube channel like when i was like right. back in like 10 15 000 subscribers because it was fun i would go on there and it'd be like oh people are actually watching these videos and commenting i'll respond to every single one um and then at some point it's like okay i can't spend three hours every day responding to comments like right. i need to just like so i don't really respond to too many comments anymore unless it's like a question or something that i think like needs to be answered for a lot of people but now people can upvote right yeah, so people it, thumbs up. Yeah, the thumbs up, and then it goes to the top, and comments, so sometimes yeah. we'll comment on that. But now it's big enough where other people comment. You know, people want, know enough about me where people, will, if someone asks a question about me, then maybe this person knows that answer and they'll comment yeah. for me, and so it's kind of nice. The following's kind of helping you out. Yeah. Is it the same on Instagram? You probably can't keep up. Yeah, Instagram is different. Like I, sh- I, I like work, working on an Instagram, but it was never the f- priority. Like YouTube was the priority, and mm-hmm. Instagram was just like, well, I might as well try and build this while I'm building the YouTube because they kind of go well together. Like I can funnel from YouTube and you know cross promoting. Right. Um, and so I, I should comment more frequently. I try sometimes, but I just am bad at like staying That's up with good. all the comments. Yeah, I think I'm getting to that point where I can't respond to every single comment. I try to respond to every single comment on every single post yeah. when it comes through. Yeah. Sometimes Instagram's good about like putting that in your notifications. Sometimes they're not. Yeah. You gotta like go to the post and like reply. But yeah, which I think it helps gets to be hard. But it, at at what cost do you do that? As you know, it's like if how I go- are you negatively affecting your production yes. or your yes. you know your brain? I guess from just staring at a screen for like two plus i mean i'm yep. at, on average like two hours a day on instagram yeah, yeah, probably. right right um well and am i gonna give up you know maybe i by the time i'd respond to all the comments on instagram like i could have shot half a youtube video and so i like could positively impact the community of clay by maybe making another video that does really well or respond to comments and so you know you're always you sacrifice one thing to do another and you just have to like put your priorities in right. place like what's important at that moment yeah so with um I guess another money type thing that I was curious about. You're at a point where your following is to a certain spot where you have people. You're kind of like influencing people that are getting into pottery and they're fresh in there. And Mm -hmm. you're kind of like getting to like sponsorship type of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe Mako helped, you know, help get you here because you're in the Mako place for the glazes you use and stuff. Like, how's the sponsorship kind of structure? Are you figuring out how to, like, you know, get sponsored for you know, promoting their products on your YouTube right, video right. or whatever. So, so far, so since this, you know, I didn't get into this to like make a ton of money, but it is a business and it is only sustainable if it makes money, right? Like that's kind of my thing is like, mm-hmm. you, I love doing things because I love them and it doesn't make money, but it has to make money to be sustainable. So, and the reason you could bring value to other people is because you're making money like on YouTube right, ads right, or, right. you know, you're being sponsored and they're helping, you know, get you some free products or... Right, right. Like, I was only able to come to Ohio to do this workshop and help, hopefully help a lot of people because, like, Mako was a sponsor for me and that we created that relationship. Um, I think I've had... I pretty much once a week or twice a week, I have emails in my inbox about sponsorships that are for random things like a home meal prep, you know, subscription Mm -hmm. service or um, Skillshare or like 
the VPN, like whatever the security, internet security like mm -hmm. companies. And so so far, I haven't taken on any brand companies that I didn't feel like I already used their stuff. Like Continental Clay was my first sponsorship that I went through. Um, was and that was that more? You reach out to them because I reached you out to Continental used Clay. Their yep. stuff. And I said, I love your company. I love your clay. I use it already. Would you guys want to be a sponsor? And they were like, Heck yeah, we would. And so. They were awesome. Then Mako was the next one. At Inseca, I found their booth, found their glazes to be amazing, and that I could layer two different glazes on each other, and I was getting as good or better results than I was getting layering three glazes on. So I said, I want to like create a long-lasting partnership with you guys, um, and would you be interested in that? And they're like, yes, we would. We would love to partner mm -hmm. with you. And so a lot has come from the Mako partnership. Could I make a lot more money if I just like said yes to every right. sponsorship deal? Yes, I could make probably two to three hundred dollars per video that I would do a sponsorship, which would be great. But it's, at the end of the day, that's not what it's about. Right. It's about creating sustainable business with people that I like and right. using the stuff. Like Connell Clay, I believe in their clay, and Mako, I believe in their glazes. So that's why I want them as sponsors. How do you like understand the best way to structure it, or like? price it the right way for video and yeah stuff. do you just have to like google like well i talked to paul YouTube blaze sponsorships yeah and stuff I, like that. I talked to paul blaze about how he did the um sponsorships for his and it's all based on your your views and so like i would take my last 10 videos if i was going to value my spot my videos right now i take my last 10 videos figure out the average views say it's 10,000 views per video for the last 10 so a high likelihood that the next 10 videos will also get an average of 10 views 10,000 views least, or more yeah, yeah. Um, and then you take a number per thousand views. Typical number for a sponsorship is like $20, 20 to $30 per yeah. thousand views. So I set a number, $25 per um, thousand views. So that times 10,000 or times 10 because you're per thousand would be $250 per video. So I'd say $250. But back when I first did the first partnerships, it was like an average of... I was basically charging a hundred dollars a video. For, and then it's like you got to scale it up over time. And yeah. It's like yeah. This number is locked. Do you like commit to like this number's locked in for three months or? What I did with kind of like and Mako was I did I sold ten videos for a thousand bucks, and so we did, and that was and they got it by the end of that they were getting such a good deal because my videos were getting way <laughs> higher views than right, they were right, when right. I set that price. So you know how you deal with it in the future, I think. Um, you know, and it's it, an interesting business in, it is. in and of itself. It is. So. And it's been fun to learn about it, but it's also like difficult to like always line up sponsors and like, do I really want to be saying that every time? It's like this video is sponsored by blah, blah, blah. And whatever. Like, but I think it's cool as like a maker that that's possible. Yeah. There's somebody that right. was making in a studio in the basement of your coffee shop right. that before February of 2018. Right. You never would have like. Right. Exactly. You thought you were trying to figure this stuff out. Like I wanted to be sponsored by a wakeboard company, but turns out the clay companies <laughs> are the ones where I could get sponsored. That's the most re relevant yeah. and all that. Right. Yeah. Cool. I'm trying to think. Those are some good stuff that I was thinking about. Um, we're probably getting to the end here. Do you have any things that like, I guess you'd want to talk about or something that like, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I, I like, if you guys, if you guys as listeners all watch my videos, like I just say thanks to everybody. Like <laughs> it's only possible for me to like have a following and have people because people actually want to watch the videos yeah. and like they share them and they support me. And so yeah. I'd say like, I, I just say thanks to everybody that watched the videos, shares them. Like yeah. I never thought that I would like be, you know, traveling to Ohio to do workshops for people and like, yeah. um, and, and yeah, like before two years ago, I was just another potter. Like there's potters that are just as good as me everywhere like i'm not that good I, like, you're as good as me you're probably better mm -hmm. like i just feel like other people are as good or better than me yeah. but the reason that i have been able to like make it a full like not full time but have been able to scale it up is just because i'm willing to share i'm willing to learn new skills like videography um and i'm willing to put in the hard work not just creating pots because when you want to make pots for a living you got to not make pots <laughs> you right know? you got to yeah. do the stuff that's not making pots and um yeah so it's been, it's been super fun. I'm excited to see where the next, like, 10 years go. I'd love to get to, like, my next goal is kind of 100,000 subscribers. Like, I think that'd be sweet. YouTube sends you, like, a silver play button. Oh, um, that's cool. It sounds dumb. But... So a silver play button that you, like, put <laughs> yeah, on the wall yeah, yeah, behind yeah. you or something? Yeah, so that's my goal. Maybe before the end of the year, if I can get a couple ASMR videos done, I think I'd get there. But um, but then next year, I'm excited to maybe do some workshops, road trips. Like, it just gets me excited thinking about yeah, all the future cool. stuff. Yeah, that's cool. The, like, options are a lot more wide range when you have when you don't have to worry about like figuring out how am i going to sell this 25 five dollar mug yeah right right i mean maybe these are problems that are different to to people that are at that position but yeah. for someone that's 
you you know young and figuring things out or you know just new to pots and you're just figuring out like yeah. how to make cylinders and right. stuff yeah like, right and I, and I want to pro- I want to keep providing value for those people like the people that are have never had any joy of throwing anything or getting things from a piece of mud to a finished pot like yeah. that's what really is inspires me about clay is that that's possible and so if I can pass that passion on to other people I think it's just like when people are doing stuff that they're excited about like the world is just a better place like if everyone is doing something that they loved everyone would be happy and like right. you're sharing that with other people and it just goes round and round and like the like the workshop coming here to do a workshop you know my fifty dollars that i was spending the value that i'm expecting to get out of it or like the money that i'm putting in is different from someone that's sitting over there that's looking to get new techniques or something yeah, like my yeah. fifty dollars was put because i wanted to see you in person yeah. chat for the podcast like and i honestly wanted to give you the fifty dollars because i know you're doing such good work yeah, yeah. for the community so it's like i'm happy to give you fifty dollars yeah, yeah, to yeah. help out everything you're doing yeah yeah well, and it's like yeah and it's so and and then and i just think that that comes from you know, hard work, passion around what I'm doing, and the ability to learn new things, right? I think those those are some right. key takeaways. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks well, so much, Ryan. We'll, we'll wrap up here. But, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, for sure. And hopefully we do some more of these interviews in the future. Yeah, yeah. Check out the Wheel Talk podcast. I mean, you're on it right now, so that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, we'll, John. Yeah, see you guys. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for listening to my talk with John Schmidt. His workshop was really fun. I would highly encourage it if you are either early in clay or more advanced. Personally, I got the most out of the marketing and business side of things. No surprise to you folks, probably. Um, And you can find all that information on his website at johnschmidtpottery.com. You can also find him on YouTube, which is his most popular area, at John the Potter, or on Instagram at John Schmidt Pottery. We'd love to hear your feedback. We're looking forward to having more guests on the podcast that have more expertise in certain areas that we can really dig deep into some of these topics. If you'd like to leave us feedback, we'd love to hear it on Instagram at Wheel Talk Podcast, or you can tag myself or Becca at RD Ceramics or at Five Lines Pottery Studio. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Have a good day.